Well, welcome everybody. How are you? Great. Good. Good. I like to hear it. Uh, thank you all for joining today. I'm Brandi Nanaki. I am the director of the Citrus Policy Lab and also an associate research professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy and a director at the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at Berkeley Law. And we're really excited to have Joan Donovan joining us today. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank um, you. This will be a really, um, I think, very important discussion in the face of uh, a pending presidential election. Um, may we not repeat the same harms that we previously saw. Uh, so a little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, today's event is sponsored by the Tech Policy Initiative, a joint program of the Goldman School of Public Policy and the Citrus Policy Lab, with support from the UC Berkeley Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Group, AFOG, the UC Berkeley AI Policy Hub, Berkeley Law, the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, the Center for Security and Politics, and the Berkeley Risk and Security Lab. It's obvious a lot of us want you here. <laughs> I appreciate today. it. A lot of relevant centers on campus. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end, so please hold your question. And we are recording this event, so if you could please wait until you receive a microphone, we would greatly appreciate it. You can see the microphones here, so you could also queue up at the end. So let's get started. Uh, while memes are often dismissed as having little to no political importance, they have become bedrock to the strategy of conspiracists and extremists. Co-authored with Emily Dreyfus and Brian Friedberg, Dr. Donovan's book, Meme Wars, the untold story of the online battles of pending democracy in America, tells the story of how Stop the Steal went from online to real life. Dr. Joan Donovan is a leading public scholar and disinformation researcher specializing in media manipulation, political movements, critical internet studies, and online extremism. She is the research director of the Harvard Kennedy School Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, and director of the Technology and Social Change Project. <laughs> so with that, thank you so much for joining me today, Joan. And as I understand it, you're gonna open up with some remarks um, about meme wars. Yes. So um, when we decided that we wanted to write a book about the history of the internet, it really only made sense to take memes as the material substance that we wanted to explore. Why? Because unfortunately, many histories of the internet begin with a great man and a great idea doing great things, increasing shareholders' profits, selling that company, and then starting another company and doing the same thing, right? And so our histories of technology always tend to center on an individual or they'll center on a company. And from my perspective, I thought, well, the internet is a very interesting place if you take it as its own kind of object and its own kind of culture. And what we really wanted to do is tell a story about how technology and the things that people do with it change our politics. So now it's working, good. Um, so this is just gonna scroll in the background while I talk to you a little bit about why, uh, why memes. Well, memes are more than just images that are hilarious usually. Uh, they have a very long history in our culture. They're part of our language advertising the, in the entire industry of advertising is essentially generations of memes uh, phrases like I'm loving it just do it you know slogans uh, company mottos these are memes in and of themselves uh, advertisers have this way of describing memes as be, uh, describing their ads as being sticky and one of the ways in which we wanted to understand memes and how culture is generated and circulates on the internet is by understanding who produces them and what they're for and how they scale. And uh, essentially we thought, well, that's one way of telling the history of memes and telling the history of the internet. 
But there's some great books about memes already. Several have been written by Whitney Phillips and Ryan Milner. So we didn't want to copy anybody either. We didn't want to write another book that just said, look, there's memes on the internet. Must be something philosophical that we could say about them. So we decided to look through a political lens at the generation of memes that start with Occupy Wall Street, and the book concludes at uh, the day of the insurrection. And we start with Occupy Wall Street because this was the first time that in the US we saw a broad-based mimetic movement, that is people that were engaging with politics uh, in a new way. They were finding one another. So if you were using the hashtag Occupy Wall Street and you were also using the hashtag Occupy San Francisco, which then got shortened to uh, o, o, hashtag OSF, you had to Occupy Oakland. It was more than just a way to stay in touch or a way to network. It was also a way to share resources and to mobilize people. And in the beginning, everybody thought social media is so cool. Look, everybody gets a voice. Everybody can participate. But like every good commodity, it gets co-opted eventually. And so social movements during Occupy had a first mover advantage with social media. And they were using the power of memes to bring people together, to mobilize. And we decided that we were going to look at some of the darker parts of Occupy the, and the Fed movement. Uh, the way in which Alex Jones participated in Occupy San Antonio. We were going to look at, uh, and how he used the term New World Order, looking at Br uh, uh, Steve Bannon and Andrew Breitbart that made a movie about Occupy called Occupy Unmasked. And uh, what we learned is that Andrew Breitbart and Steve Bannon and, and Alex Jones and Ron Paul and, and, the, and the Fed movement really saw the potential of the internet to mobilize very early on, just in the same way that you might tell a story about organizing within the Occupy movement around anarchism and more liberal politics. The same could be said for not just right-wing politics, but we're talking about right-wing politics that are in the style of libertarianism, and then uh, perhaps even, even further right. And so we then started to trace what happened after that moment in Occupy, and we go through uh, this period in internet history known as Gamergate, where there were a lot of media manipulation tactics being tried out for the first time, including massive impersonation mm -hmm. of large groups of people, we then go into the formation of the alt-right movement that Steve Bannon and Breitbart.com, the, the news, uh, news, news, <laughs> news organization uh, used to, to build momentum behind the alt-right. And then we show how the stars of that movement, like Richard Spencer, like Baked Alaska, like Milo Yiannopoulos, transformed into the social media hype men of the MAGA movement and how the MAGA movement represented a very uncomfortable coalition between different factions between the right wing that made peace, I would say, with one another in order to push Donald Trump forward. And later in the book, it becomes apparent why I say it was an uncomfortable piece in the sense that by the time 2020 rolls around, Donald Trump has not fulfilled the promises of building the wall, of mass deportation. Of, uh, he did get the border shut down for uh, quite a long time during the pandemic, uh, but he wasn't espousing this uh, heavy white nationalist vibe that these actors online had come to expect of him. And so during 2020, there was a massive fracture within this group of people that had come together in a tacit coalition in 2016. And so by the end of the book, you realize that the different strains of far right groups uh, disagree with each other fundamentally on some of the mainstay principles of, let's say, the GOP. They, 
the far right thought that John, uh, Donald Trump had been softened by working in government. They had come up with these ideas that he was really being controlled by the quote unquote new world order or the deep state. And we end the book really showing how all of these actors gained a lot of clout, they gained a lot of money, they gained a lot of notoriety for riding on Donald Trump's coattails, but they really weren't able to mobilize uh, a massive, uh, what they were anticipating in a red tide. Um, and instead, or red wave, however you want to put it, instead what ended up happening to a lot of these people that participated in the meme wars over the years, whether it was Roger Stone or Steve Bannon or Milo, is that many of them ended up in jail, many ended up arrested, and a lot of it had to do with how mobilization somewhere along the line turned into incitement. And this might be a good you know, discussion for us to have later, especially if we have sociologists in the, in the audience, which is when social media is helping us reach what we might call pro-social or uh, values of liberty, dignity, democracy, we like what it can do. But when it turns into uh, lies and disinformation that incite people to go overthrow the government, we don't like that. But it's the same technology, right? And it's, some of it are the same kinds of practices of posting memes, of getting people hyped up, of getting them to move from the couch or move from the wires to the weeds. That is to get them to go do something different with their day that they wouldn't otherwise do. And I contend that mobilization is something that people participate in social movements because uh, in some ways there's a grievance that they want addressed or there's a right that they're fighting for. But when it comes to incitement, something else has to happen. And when you analyze how the meme of Stop the Steal came about, and you look at its history, it actually begins in 2015. Roger Stone registers the, the domain Stop the Steal because he believes Trump is going to have the primary stolen from him. And so this meme and this tactic was pre-existing 2020. It just needed to be rolled out in 2020 when people were outraged at the idea that the election had been stolen. And I think the key piece of the puzzle, uh, and I'll shut up after this, I promise, Brandy, <laughs> is that you don't get Donald Trump being able to call for uh, a wild protest without the openness of these social media platforms. And social media platforms, in many ways, are the amplifiers of all kinds of information. Their sole role is like a boom box. You put the cassette tape in, you crank up the volume. And in that cranking up of the volume, whatever the content is, if it agitates people, if it causes outrage, if they feel like their rights are being torn from them, if they feel like their livelihoods are on the chopping block, they will react. And for Stop the Steal, a lot of people felt earnestly that communism was coming, Antifa had taken over the government. I mean, in San Francisco, you guys know about Antifa, right? Mm -hmm. They're like running the food, not bombs. They're not taking over the co government that often. Um, but, you know, it, but it was the same thing during Occupy. Instead of Antifa, it was anonymous. Mm -hmm. And now, instead of Antifa, it's trans violence, right? And so they're always trying to point the finger at a small group of people that have no representation, no voice, uh, as what ails the country and what's coming for their rights and what is going to take over their livelihoods and stop them from living their uh, existence. And this to me is uh, a pattern and the pattern in my mind plays out as a meme war because what it is is the struggle over a definition of something. If you paid attention to, see this is why I lie, 
as I said the last thing, but then I yeah, didn't but mean then it. Keep, yeah. But one other thing, <laughs> like another contemporary example that we're all living through is the battle over the word woke. So in 2011, 2012, if anybody said the word woke, they were usually either queer or in uh, some African-American or black subculture, right? And you didn't hear it a lot, but then during Ferguson, people started saying it because there was a moment in time where people needed to wake up. And the trope of the idea that your movement needs to be awakened, that your movement will rise, these are common memes associated with movements. QAnon had a version of the awakening where you wake up and you become attuned to something. The red pill, mm -hmm. that's another version of becoming awake. But woke had been around and it was most popular, I would say, in 2014, 2015. Um, and what was happening then was a struggle over the word social justice. Social justice is a word that comes from Christianity and Catholicism is that it's your duty to perform uh, social justice, that you should be part of society and working towards a more just society. So they hadn't caught on to woke then. They were still memeing about social justice warriors. Now we're in the era of woke, which not a lot of liberals or progressives use that term anymore. Uh, it's like a lot of subcultural language. It comes in, it comes out. I don't know how old all of you are, but when I was younger, you used to say, when you would say just kidding, or you would try to you know, point out that someone was wrong, you'd say you're toast or you're burnt kid. Like you're burnt kid, you're toast, right? <laughs> Nobody says that anymore, but for a time, it exists and woke had its time with liberals and progressives and social movements and subcultures. And now the meme war is being fought on the right because they want to redefine that term as being uh, this uh, a kind of clown world where, uh, which is another meme they use to describe a society that is everything for everyone. Um, and that in that society, in that vision, um, we've now started to see people who would use the term woke, when they're asked to define it, they will say woke is anti-white. And prior to that, the meme was diversity is anti-white within these far-right groups. And so we're seeing this happen, and it's really important, I think, for scholars to call attention to what's happening in the culture wars, give a little bit of history, but then also understand that technology is going to feed this fire. And it's going to push these polarization. It's going to push polarization, and it's going to target the most marginalized people, the people that struggle to get up and be seen. Because not everybody wants to be seen. Some people just want to live their lives. Some people just want to go to Target, get their pride gear, and come back home. Right? <laughs> Which they can't out. do anymore. They can't do it anymore. Not unless you go to the back of the store. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, Target is removing some of its pride content because of pushback. Um, but thank you, Joan, for giving this overview. I have so much to ask you and unpack mm -hmm. on this. So I actually want to start thinking about history a little bit and where we have been before. Are we really in a new place with the use of memes in social media? Like, how different is this from, like, clandestine hand pamphlets and satirical political cartoons? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, because um, it used to be to get your message across and to uh, expand recruitment into explicitly white nationalist movements as they would make flyers, they'd have uh, the Klan had the Imperial Nighthawk newsletter. Um, interestingly, this was even in the late 60s weaponized by the FBI would send postcards to people who were in the Klan. They would send postcards to all their neighbors with the misaddress just to let their neighbors know that a grand dragon lived on their street. It yeah. was, you know, the way in which law enforcement engaged with white supremacist organizing has always been a difficult topic because. It's partway infiltration, but also the Klan comes from a, a civic group. They were a civic group. They had teachers, they had police officers, they had business owners, and they would make lots of um, ephemera uh, to share, newsletters, manifestos, 
what have you. And, and things shifted as culture shifted and the clan became much more anonymous. They would uh, wear hoods instead of wearing hoods that uh, displayed their faces. It was no longer something they could be proud of. And by the mid seventies, uh, the tide had turned post Black Panthers and post um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, into a society that was interested in uh, equality for all. It didn't mean it was going to play out everywhere. Individual interactions still were problems. Different states still had um, laws against interracial marriage on the books and, and uh, laws against uh, adopting children of other races. Uh, but when it came to the ephemera, uh, white supremacists have always gotten their message out there using whatever technology was possible. And they were some of the very first people to adopt Blackboard systems in the early 90s online. Yeah. And Don Black, who founded Stormfront, which is the first major neo-Nazi message board and a website I spent entirely too much time on in my postdoc looking at how neo-Nazis uh, understand genetic ancestry information. But that website began in 1996, and it was a well-known haven for white supremacists, and it was international as well. But there was a code of secrecy. There was anonymity. Things really shifted, I would say, online right after the murder of Trayvon Martin. Here you have a generation of people that are raised now, young people are raised in a society where race has become normalized in the sense that we learn about racism, we understand that racism is a bad thing, we don't try to judge people based on what they look like. Um, but then Trayvon Martin happens and it's about this kid and he's young and he's just out buying some candy and he's got his hood up, mm -hmm. it's raining a bit and he gets killed on his walk home. This is crazy. And who did it? George Zimmerman. And what ended up happening online that not a lot of people understood was that this was the first engagement of racial politics with younger white men who didn't understand what a white Latino was. They were on 4chan and other anonymous message boards trying to understand why people cared so much about this dead kid. And they couldn't understand why the media was referring to Zimmerman as a white Latino, because they always thought that Latinos were people of color and that they thought they were being baited into a racial justice discussion when there was no racial justice discussion to be had. Mm. And this is literally the red pilling moment of people like Richard Spencer who ended up founding the alt-right. It's a moment in time where younger people are trying to understand their place in the world, and this is the racial politic that's happening as they're trying to understand different races, they're trying to understand where their place is, and then you see the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and what Black Lives Matter at that time is doing with, with justice for Trayvon Martin, um, and as well as uh, justice for Mike Brown, is that they're calling attention, not just to police brutality, but white vigilanteism mm -hmm. and the way in which white culture operates as a surveillance mechanism. So we have a whole chapter in the book, Meme Wars, about Trayvon Martin and about the memes that circulated. And it's, it's a pretty brutal chapter because young people online were doing this meme called Trayvoning, where they were posing as Trayvon Martin as, as dead children and taking pictures of themselves and posting them online and making fun of this and making fun of the media. And one of the strains throughout the book that you learn about the history of the internet is the history of the internet as being anti-media. And if you look at even the calling, you know, cards of the internet, YouTube was all about broadcast yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Be the media. And so at that moment, 
not only are young people learning that racial politics isn't what they think it is, but they're also believing a lot of people that are posting online that are saying the media is out to get them, it's out to denigrate white men, and that if white men don't rise up in groups, that there's going to be problems for them in the future. And then you enter a character like Milo Yiannopoulos, who takes this moment and writes uh, derogatory things about Trayvon Martin, as well as about Black Lives Matter. I want to get in on this, though, because yeah. my next question is whether or not, essentially, who's behind all of this? Are there certain actors who are like running something like a meme factory, where they start the seed and give this out, and then it starts to get that groundswell kind of astroturfing, where it feels like it's coming from the community? That's the first part of my question. Mm -hmm. And my second part is, People like Milo, are they just taking advantage of these situations to gain that clout and notoriety? Mm -hmm. Are they really in, do they really believe what they're espousing online or? Well, I tend to think about, let's start with the belief question, which is, I tend to believe what people do, you know? And so if Milo Yiannopoulos is spending an egregious amount of time going from campus to campus, saying horrible things about women, saying horrible things about lesbians, saying horrible things about uh, trans people, then I, I do think he believes it. There was also this- But he himself is a gay man. Yeah, right? well, maybe. He, he, he's since recanted and is, is now uh, is rethinking that plan. But okay. part of the foil <laughs> of him at Breitbart, I mean, these, these kids and their fluid sexualities, what can I say? <laughs> Um, I'm a lesbian, you know, yeah. so I'm like, I don't know, I got my terminology in the 80s, so I'm just sticking with it. But um, <laughs> I'll never grow up, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, no, when I think about it, you know, part of the thing that made him the tip of the spear when he was at Breitbart is he could say these things because he occupied that identity category. Right, yeah. and so Breitbart, uh, at, well, Steve Bannon, who was the head of Breitbart at the time, saw him as the weapon, right? Because he could say anything about queer men and queer people and then be able to say, but I'm one of them. But I don't get that because it's a yeah. hypocrite. Yeah. Like a normal person well, would hear them say that and say you're a hypocrite. The example online right now is someone like Blair White, who's like constantly saying things that could be construed as anti-trans that is a trans person. And that's where I think we have to think about our politics, politics is extremely messy and that, you know, there will be liberals who are really into guns and there'll be, you know, right wingers that are smoking pot. Like, that's just how I have to say it like that because I'm in Berkeley. Yeah. You know, I have to go back to the, the 60s version. Um, or April 20th of this year. <laughs> yeah, this year. Long. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to convey is that um, hypocrisy is what they're trying to point out. And they're saying, see, mm. I can't have this belief because the liberals say it's not good for me to feel this way about lesbians as a, as a gay man. And he used to use that trope all the time. Mm. He, would, he went on a campus tour called Feminism is Cancer. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, what they've done is taken internet culture, a place like 4chan that is a hotbed of depravity, um, and they, Milo Yiannopoulos used to call the people that worked for him truffle pigs, because they would go on to 4chan and find the most cringiest, most outrageous memes, and then he would put them into his show. And so, but these memes were organic? I mean, they really emerged well, they from were, the community? They, a lot of them were what's called cringe, which is when uh, basically someone gets caught saying or doing something that's just kind of, you know, like when someone gets really mad at a student. Like Charlie Kirk makes all his money off of cringe, which is it? Mm -hmm. he'll speak at a university like this, and then students will be like, why are you saying this? You know, women should have the right to, uh, you know, reproductive health care. And he'd be like, it's people like you are the reason why families are so lost. And that reaction is what they're looking for. And then that gets the views. 
And so cringe has become a kind of content online that if you can elicit it, you can, you can make a lot of attention and then... Money. Uh, and money, of course. Mm -hmm. But some of them are organic, some of them are engineered. I'll tell you one that failed miserably recently was Dark MAGA. So they really wanted to make Dark MAGA a thing and they planted it on 4chan and they thought, oh, this is gonna be great. Like MAGA 2.0 is gonna be Dark MAGA. And they had all these memes from the movie Grease, which is like, this is, these are boomer memes, right? You know? And, you know, there's the one where it's like MAGA is when, I forget the name of the one with the blonde hair, but she's like, you know, kind of prissy. And Sandy. Like, Sandy. Okay. And then she gets Sandy. all like sexed up, right? Yeah. So like MAGA is when she's just like, you know, the schoolgirl, And then when she gets all hot, you know, it's, uh, it's ultra MAGA. And everyone in the comments were like, this is a plant, this is a plant. Because yeah. you can't, the thing about memes that is so important to understand is they cannot be engineered. Hmm. They have to, in some ways, have some kind of ironic twist or transgressive twist to them in order to go very, very viral. So when you had Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016 operating a very normal kind of postcard campaign mm -hmm. where it's pictures of her and hashtag I'm with her and right. it's all very normal. And then Trump's got him as Pepe and he's like, you know, dressed up, he's, he's Rambo at some points, you know. It, it, it just invites people to participate and to remix. And so the best memes tend to be anonymous, participatory, sticky, and then somehow transgressive. That is, you can't have a meme war that is um, nice, right? And this is where people who might be considered politically correct, uh, they have a hard time with meme wars because it just doesn't make a lot of sense to them. Remember the memes that were going around of Trump like being this like really big guy with a tiny ween? And like people were like, you shouldn't body shame him. It's like, it's a meme, you know? But that's what the reaction is. But if you can't get outrage on one side and lulls on the other, your meme is pretty much dead in the water. What you really need to do is tap into a subculture or tap into something that uh, people think is, is somehow funny or notable. Yeah. Do you think that generative AI will play a role in this space? Like, oh, totally. Like totally. mid-journey and the image creation and then also text through GPT? But if it's yeah. automated and made, then does it not get at that kind of well, like, you don't, you won't local know. groundswell knowledge? Yeah, you won't know is the thing. When you're engaging with this stuff, a really well-made meme is not going to have any logos on it. It's not going to have anything that are going to cue you into the fact that it's generated by AI. It's, I view the AI in memes being something where you can quickly make a lot of content. And uh, you can have very similar iterations of things. When it comes to memes as slogans, though, what we know is that three word terms, and if any of you are studying PR, uh, advertising, you know, three words is the best. So lock her up, build the wall, those kinds of memes really stick. Uh, <clears throat> jobs, not mobs. And advertising, just do it. Just do it. I'm loving it. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of three and, word ads. Yeah. And, and unless you're building your, you know, a luxury brand or something that's not really going to have advertising like that, you'll have a little bit more design elements. But what we've mm -hmm. noticed is some of, the, some of the memes that have been used by political operatives tend to be screenshotted a bunch of times. Like they want that degraded quality to it. They want it to look a little pixelated. They want it, you know, it's internet parlance. It's called a shit post, right? And so it's a screenshot of a screenshot of a screenshot. Um, and these do really well, especially if you plant them on Reddit. Um, during the 2016 election, to get back to your question about factories, so during 2016, there was the Bernie Sanders dank meme factory on 
Facebook that was generating a, you know, a fair amount of memes every day that were new and were targeted towards different audiences. And then you had the Reddit's the Donalds that were cultivating meme campaigns, but they weren't just cultivating meme campaigns for the sake of meme campaigns. They were doing things to disrupt what we understood of other competitors' campaigns. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, they, on Reddit's the Donalds, they took a bunch of pictures of um, young men and, and young families and they put the hashtag draft our daughters or draft my wife on it with Hillary Clinton's logo. And then they started, so they, they used Reddit as the hive to build all these memes. Mm -hmm. And then they circulated them on Twitter as if they were big fans of Hillary Clinton. Now you can imagine if you're a content moderator and these memes show up, you're not gonna know that they're not some you know, po actual political campaign that's being pushed out there by a bunch of volunteers. You're not gonna know that something like this is controversial because you're likely in the Philippines and are exactly. just looking for boobs and butts, like, you know, it's, or gore. Um, and so that campaign, even though it never really got off the ground because it was almost so outrageous that uh, people could, people that were in the campaign world could easily clock it as disinformation most people just saw it, passed over it, and were like, what's she up to? I don't get this, but whatever. So what, what is the role of platforms in monitoring this content? And we had a previous discussion where we talked about awful but lawful content. I mean, obviously, First Amendment doesn't apply directly to platforms or a private company, but if we were to have legislation passed that said, hey, you know, platforms you need to mitigate the spread of X type of content that is legal but might be harming um, that would violate the first amendment so what pressure can we put on platforms to mitigate the spread of disinformation it's a good question but i i think the product is the problem we don't have other institutions in our society that scale misinformation like social media platforms do and if you do, there are other remedies for that, including like what Dominion did with Fox. So other industries that allow for broadcast have different responsibilities to society because there are laws. Now, that same information about Dominion was all over Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and you can't sue them because they are considered uh, the tubes and wires. They're, basic, they're considered infrastructure. There's a law called Section 230, and if I say it too loud, the lawyers will come running. So I won't mention that or freeze peach. But <laughs> freeze peach. <laughs> freeze peach, yeah. That's how we get around saying, getting the lawyers in conversations. We don't, we don't say free speech, or at least we don't say it loud. We say freeze peach. Um, <laughs> but in any event, you know, there are these laws that were made in the 90s, 1996, mm -hmm. that said, hey, uh, the Internet's on the rise. You can transfer data. It only takes you three minutes to download a JPEG these days. You know, if you want, it, you want that new Metallica album, you're going to be downloading it all night long. You know, how much... Rocking out by the morning. You know, but yeah. how much trouble are we going to get into, right? And so they make this law that says that if you're a computer service company, uh, anything that happens on your platform is not your fault. That is before the era of HD broadcast. It's before the era of mobile phones. It's before the era of deep fakes. It's before the era of... Um, memes. Memes. <laughs> And ostensibly, you know, internet radio uh, or podcasting. So in one way, regulation like that can help mature an industry. That is, having less regulation at the beginning of an industry makes sense so that there can be more wider experimentation. But not a lot of people are using those services. So you can think about it analogous to the production of the first airplane. Right, the first airplane wasn't meant to fly passengers. People died. 
you know, and anybody could build an airplane and jump off a cliff. Uh, but the minute you put customers on that airplane, there arises a need for regulation, a need for uh, norms in the playing field. And that's what we lack when it comes to social media, is that every platform has a different schema by which it implements its terms of service. And like I was saying this morning, when it comes to lawful but awful, awful could violate a terms of service, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to get caught. So it's a lot like speeding on the highway. That is, you can speed all you want, but the minute you get caught, you're going to get penalized. And the only thing that media manipulators and disinformers really react to and change their uh, strategy with is deplatforming. Because they know the most important asset they have is access to the public through these enormous social media products. Yeah. And I love this highway analogy because you could also think about platforms and their use of content moderators. It's like you have thousands of miles of highway and you have two patrol officers monitoring. That's you know? it. Yeah. Because there's an incentive for them to have the traffic mm -hmm. on the highway. So mm -hmm. they turn a blind eye, but then they can report to Congress that we increased 100%. We increased from one to two. We had a 100% increase in yeah. the number of content moderators. Mm -hmm. And that's why we fight for data that has to do about transparency. How many takedowns? For what reason? Are, they, you know, are these takedowns related to specific kinds of influence operations? Now, I work at a policy school that is unlike Goldman in the sense that um, it hosts a lot of clandestine meetings full of spies. Um, and you learn ostensibly when you traffic in these, in these groups that the government and other governments use these platforms to their benefit. Mm -hmm. So you learn in a policy school about dime. The way you fight a war is diplomacy, information, military, and the economy. And that information, the I and dime, is something that is so hard to figure out when it comes to how are these social media platforms being used by different governments to disrupt or to cause chaos or to uh, amplify already pre-existing wedge issues. Uh, and, and those are the kinds of things that our research really tries to zone in on is not to say, okay, everybody's got an uncle that's a bit of a lunatic online and you know, posts some zany things. That's not the kind of information that researchers are looking for. What we're looking for is evidence of politicians, uh, certain kind of uh, bad actor, be they, um, you know, marketers sometimes, but often they're um, uh, dark ops type folks that are working on the edges of issues that are trying to cause uh, society to either divest from a problem that they've been working on or to pick a side. And when you see that kind of dark ops happening, it tends to have this pattern. And this is where technologists and data scientists are really useful because they can cull a bunch of data and then look for the patterns in it. And often what we've been seeing and what has been corroborated by the lab at UW uh, is exactly this, that there are repeat offenders who make money as an industry trafficking disinformation. They are for hire, and they're not just in this country. Jonathan Corpus Ong has beautiful research about the Philippines and, and disinformation um, teams, essentially, that will go out and hoax the internet, just like a search engine optimization company or... I'm sure half a dozen of you at some point have been employed as a social media expert somewhere. Uh, but these are the kinds of things where the technology is manipulatable. And as a result, uh, we're not getting the highest quality information. And so that's why I think that platform companies are not going to be able to solve the problem they've created because it's the same thing that makes them money. And if you, take, if you take 
them at their word that they're working on it and you don't audit them and you don't use your academic skill set to come at those questions, um, then you're deluding yourself into believing that they're here for the public good. Because Thanks. companies employ PR people for a reason. But when you're in academia, your job is to find out the truth, whether you like it or not. And that's a hard bargain, especially when you're up against people who are trying to say that this technology itself isn't what's harming people. It's the bad people using our technology that harms people. And then you think, okay, I heard that one before. Exactly. You know. So we have about eight minutes left or so, and I'm getting some audience questions, but also I think that the mics are live, so if you also want to just go to a mic, you can. And this question was actually the next question I was going to ask you, because we're focusing primarily on the right but I'd love to know more about how the left uses memes. So what, you know, why has the right seemingly been so much more adept at creating these memes for political ends? Is that a true assumption? Are the no, left- No, you're missing it because you're steeped in it. So I'd say the greatest mm -hmm. meme of the last 10 years has gotta be Black Lives Matter. Everybody knows what it's about, whether mm -hmm. they like it or not, it's become a household thing. And it's endured uh, for almost 10 years, which is pretty hard to do if it's just a, a fad kind of meme or a trend. Uh, also three words. Yes, of You've course. opened my eyes I to know, this. Right? Now everybody, you're going to see well, these three words. Well, there had been slogans. even before that uh, groups that were, were called Black Life Matters. And so those things switched a little bit, but not much has changed. And I think that that's, you know, really important one to mark. One that you probably don't know that you were steeped in that I think is kind of funny um, only because people get, they get super triggered when I say this in a funny way, but all conservatives are Nazis, right? Like everybody's heard a version of that or a version of this idea that the right wing are just Nazis. Isn't this like Godwin's law? Yes, <laughs> on the internet, uh, on that the internet every, everything turns into Nazis. But yeah. that one was very, very popular and I think motivated a lot of people's voting behavior in 2018. Um, but I would say, you know, contemporary uh, one that we just lived through on the left is calling um, what happened in 2020 the big lie, right? So the left is very good at naming things and bringing them those names to mean, you know, like a meme does, is it means a whole bunch of other stuff. And the meaning is much more deeper uh, than you can explain. But if you say the big lie, it becomes very easy to know that I'm giving you the liberal perspective on the 2020 election. Um, and so the left can meme, they just don't know they're doing it, hmm. you know? <laughs> And it's not as campaign driven as the right in the sense the right uses memes much more for political mobilization, which is very similar to the way the left was using memes in 2011 with Occupy Wall Street and right. all the different iterations. Should the left do it, though, to kind of like an well, arms race of memes? Because it's, you know, the kinds of memes that do well online tend to be much more transgressive. Mm. Like racist memes do really well, sexist, homophobic, transphobic memes do really well. Um, you know, there was this moment in the early aughts where, you know, everything was cats online and <laughs> I can has cheeseburger and those kinds of memes, grumpy cat even. Um, we I miss those times. But we have a really long history of like, asshole cats like we got Heathcliff we've got Garfield <laughs> we've got the Cheshire cat it, right. like, these these have a very long history in our culture yeah. right just because they get digitized doesn't mean uh necessarily that they're a, you know um they don't have a link back to culture but the left does mean but they mean in these in these much broader terms and things have changed over the years and I think you know whoever is 
doing the culture wars have to their advantage memes. But we had a good meme in public health during the pandemic, flatten the curve. Remember that? Yeah. Everybody was like, I'm going to flatten the curve. Two also weeks. Also three words. Two weeks to flatten the curve. I'm out here for this. And then it was like 12 months later. Exactly. I was still wearing basketball shorts. So I was like, <laughs> that was my pandemic. So I think a lot of people in the audience have experienced and you know, witnessed some of these memes. So what can the average person do to push back against these harmful memes that they might come across? It's, it's a good question because algorithms don't care about your analysis. So anything that you do to engage with something harmful is just going to promote that thing that's harmful. However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't fight back. I think what, when you're tempted to post in outrage uh, and just reproduce the thing and point it out and say this is atrocious, not so good. This is why the <laughs> practice of like subtweeting and... Uh, and taking screenshots of all. Can you explain to everybody what subtweeting is? Subtweeting is when you want to say something about something happening, but you don't want to use any of the keywords or the names of the people involved. And so you'll just say something with a little bit of side eye, you know, and that mm -hmm. people who are in, in the know, in the know, know will see it or in your audience will see it and say, oh, yeah, I get what they're saying. I'm that person who goes back and tries to figure out. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go down that rabbit hole, too, quite, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but then, but s screenshotting and, you know, highlighting and explaining to people why this is harmful uh, can have uh, a better effect on the audiences. And you have to think about it too, where you're positioned. Are you uh, mostly just trying to inform the people that are engaging with you? Or are you running a social media campaign as a social movement organizer? Right, you have to think about how do I get, engage on this topic without giving amplification power to the bad actors, and then also how do I show support for the people that are being attacked or the groups of people that are being maligned here. And I think that um, it's important, though, that we don't just turn away. There are some topics, though, that you don't want to necessarily engage with on those levels. I wrote a paper with, um, with uh, Dana Boyd about certain kinds of information and how, uh, particularly information about suicide and methods of suicide and whatnot, these are the things that are really dangerous to engage with because you might be sharing a story about someone who committed suicide, but if that story is not written to the parameters and, and ethical guidelines of journalism, you might end up compounding the trauma because people who are near suicidal might read that and figure out, oh, the, it, it basically happens anytime a celebrity um, uh, unfortunately commits suicide is we see a rash of suicides with a similar method. Mm -hmm. And so the big advice is not to report that method. And then the same thing goes with white supremacist organizing. Uh, we used to have all these lists of things to tell journalists, and, and now we don't have to do it so often, but some of it has to do with, well, when you're reporting out a story about a white nationalist, don't just like hand over the microphone and let him say whatever he wants to say. Mm -hmm. You know, you should engage in editing. You shouldn't go live, like Trump's town hall shouldn't have been live. Um, Shouldn't and, have been video too. Yeah, and then also what you hyperlink to, right? Because the hyperlinking is something that gives more amplification online. And so thinking about if you're a journalist and you're writing a story and then you're hyperlinking to a mass murderer's manifesto and you say, well, what's the problem with that? And you say, well, that manifesto isn't written to tell the world about why they did it, it's written to inspire the next mass murderer, right. right? And so you're just doing the job of circulating it. And so we've gotten a lot of those principles integrated into tech platforms. And luckily, it's been harder and harder to find mass murderers manifestos over the past couple of years. Um, but there was an unfortunate situation where there was um, a couple of people were killed in, in the um, murderer was trans and there were people online calling for the manifesto to be put out 
and the government, it, this person hadn't put their manifesto online, mm. uh, but there is some kind of writing about what happened in their, in their home um, that the government now has a handle on. But I do think that it's very dangerous that if we let just all information out there for all to see, um, we could be creating much more damage. And so I think every individual has to make uh, a kind of pledge to themselves not to post an outrage and, uh, and then also to be a good informer for your friends and family. I mean, you know, especially if you're a student and you're going to school at Berkeley, share the knowledge, right? Exactly. Well, thank you so much for that guidance, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, please join me in thanking Joan Donovan. Thank you so much.